Good morning. We're happy to see all of you here. Beautiful Lord's Day morning as we come together on this Sunday for Bible class and a little later for our worship. We're so happy that you are here on our fifth Sunday of the month. Most people recognize um, maybe like five Fridays or something, you know, as, as the months roll around, but preachers usually recognize the five Sunday months. And so it's a, it's a fifth Sunday and uh, the last day of July and tomorrow will be August the 1st, Lord willing. And we are so happy uh, that you are here. Uh, we're grateful that uh, all who went to um, Collinsville made it back safely last week. Um, if you were not here Wednesday night, I would, I would encourage you to go hear Alan's lesson, Can I Choose My Gender? Had a, had a, a lot of information. And, uh, and I had the outline, if you would like it. Uh, he, uh, I guess he emailed it to me immediately when I requested it. So if you would like an outline, I'll be happy to share that with you. But uh, we're happy to see you here today. We're continuing our study of the Apostle Philip. There are still some handouts uh, out on the tables if you would like to get one, if you did not get one last week. And uh, you're welcome uh, to do so. Before we get into our class, though, we will we'll have our prayer. Are there any? When, I know Harry Roberts, of course, we want to keep Harry in our prayers. I saw the announcements uh, saying that he's still at North Alabama Medical Center, so I've not heard any different. So, uh, okay, he's not sure. Okay, very, thank you. Uh, yeah, a couple of days ago he was thinking maybe he would get out, but uh, he's still there and not sure when he'll get out. So I want to continue to remember Harry Roberts uh, in our prayers. Uh, this will be announced later, but JP will be preaching tonight. Uh, we. Instead of doing the third Sunday, he took the fifth Sunday because I'm at Maud tonight in their summer series. I've never heard of a Sunday night summer series, but I have two, uh, one tonight and one next month. So, uh, uh, so I guess people are mixing it up a little bit get from Wednesday to Sunday, but uh, uh, JP will be preaching tonight. Um, any, any other prayer requests? Yes, Charles. Sure, absolutely. Absolutely appreciate that, Charles. We, a lot, of, a lot of people who are lost want to keep them in our prayers. And those who are homeless and, and some without food, absolutely. Appreciate your kind and tender heart. When we first moved to Florence, uh, when we first started with Wood Avenue the first time, I would walk to work quite often, uh, living just about a mile away. And uh, one day on the way home, I got caught in a little rain shower and I popped in where Charles lived. And Charles didn't know me at the time, I'm sure. I'd only been here a couple weeks. And uh, he walked in and said, hello. Then he stopped and he came right back out to me. He said, is there anything I can do for you? And as far as I know, Charles thought I was a complete stranger. And just a kind heart, kind heart. Appreciate Charles so much. Um, any other prayer requests? Black. Okay. Okay. Cheryl Black, Tom and Cheryl Black, they're back in the States right now. She has pancreatic cancer. They're missionaries to Bulgaria. Absolutely want to remember them. He, he currently has COVID and she has pancreatic cancer. So I want to remember them in our prayers. Anyone else? Okay. Let's, uh, let's pray. Our God and Father in heaven, we thank you for your love and your blessings. We thank you for the opportunity to come together to study your word. We're grateful, Father, for all of our classes, all of our teachers, for all who are here. We're grateful that uh, we're able to, to offer uh, classes from uh, the, the youngest uh, up through our uh, adult classes. And we're, uh, we pray that you'll be with all of our teachers, that we will always prepare well and according to your word. And, that you'll be glorified through these efforts. Help us to especially influence our children and grandchildren. Teach them how to love you, how to know you, how to have their own faith in you, and how to live a life of service to you. Father, we're uh, grateful for uh, the time that we'll come together in the next hour to worship. And we pray that our minds and thoughts will be focused. We're grateful for this Bible class that can help prepare our thoughts in that direction. Thank you, Father, for our elders and their families. We ask your blessings to be upon them. Please be with Kevin and Trey as they shepherd the congregation here at Wood Avenue. The decisions that they make, we ask your blessings to be with them. Please be with all of our deacons and their areas of service. We're grateful uh, to them. We 
We ask your blessings to be upon them and their families. We ask your blessings to be upon our ministers that we will work faithfully and glorify you as, uh, as this congregation would have us to do so here. And for each and every member, we're thankful, Father, for the love and the unity. We pray that we will continue to keep it in a peaceful way according to your word and that uh, the work that we do, whether known or not known, would glorify you. Heavenly Father, we pray for the blacks. We uh, ask your blessings to be upon them and their health uh, at this time, especially Cheryl and her uh, muse. And we ask uh, you, the doc, that you'd be with her and her health and the doctors that they'll do the very best for her. Continue to pray for the lost, for those who don't, uh, don't uh, have as much, the, the homeless, the hungry. We, we're grateful for Charles and his heart uh, to think about them. Pray for the orphans, the widows. And pray that we'll do what we can in the right way uh, to help those uh, who are in need. Father, we uh, continue to pray for Harry. We ask your blessings to be upon him and uh, that he'll have strength uh, while in the hospital and then upon his return home. Bless us throughout our study today. Uh, pray that we please you as we look to the life of Philip. Help us to learn more about this man uh, and areas to imitate. As always, through your word, we learn areas to avoid. May we seek to always glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week we uh, made our transition uh, into the Apostle Philip. Uh, we looked at John chapter 1 and verse 43. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. This is after um, Andrew and uh, Peter and John, possibly James, uh, were following the Lord, but it all happens right there in that short period of time. Uh, as I mentioned, just a quick uh, reminder of what we looked at last week with Philip. We begin the second group of apostles, and Philip always heads that second group. You know, we said within these three groups, there are changes um, in, in the order, but the three who head the groups are always the same. Peter always heads the first group. Philip always heads the second group. He's the first one mentioned in all four accounts given. We mentioned, um, you know, how uh, this Philip, it's important to remember, I know sometimes names are confusing, and when we have, uh, you know, this, the same name with different people in the Bible, we ran into that with uh, John and James, uh, we'll run into it with others, but with Philip, you know, Philip is, out of the two that would come to mind, Philip is going to be the lesser known, I would think. Uh, I did not ask this question the way I asked it with James and John, but I, I would think that if you say Philip, you would think of Philip the evangelist first in the book of Acts, uh, in his work that you read about in Acts chapter 6 and again chapter 8, and then about him being an evangelist in chapter 21. I don't know what, what comes to mind first to you, but that would be for me, and it's probably because the book of Acts is going to be perhaps the, the most studied book uh, within Churches of Christ, at least. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a book that's, that uh, people uh, study uh, quite often, and it's, it's, it's nothing wrong with that as long as we're not neglecting the other 65 books and, and putting proper attention to studying them. Now, a lot of times people will study that book with the rest of the New Testament because it all ties into Acts, so uh, that happens as well. But this Philip, the apostle, is not the Philip that we read about in, in the book of Acts. We talked about how uh, he was from Bethsaida, the same home as Andrew and Peter. Very likely he was a fisherman uh, with his hometown being located on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, probably one of the ones who went fishing with Peter in John 21, the night um, that Peter said, I'm going fishing. This is after the resurrection of Jesus. So we talked about all of that. We talked about how Philip, or excuse me, Peter and Andrew and uh, probably knew Philip perhaps all their lives, perhaps seven of the apostles, you know, had known each other for many years or all of life is certainly a, a possibility. Today we're ready to begin on Roman numeral number three, Roman numeral number three, Philip the disciple and apostle. So remember this disciple is, is a follower and he chose to be a follower of, of uh of God, and, and by the way, I, I don't think there's anything wrong referring to ourselves today as disciples. Um, you know, Acts chapter 11, the disciples were first called Christians. Our, we usually call ourselves Christians, but you know, the, there are multiple names or descriptions in the Bible for you name it. You know, our elders, elders have 
uh, you know, elders or shepherds or pastors, um, you know, and so uh, disciples, um, you know, sometimes that reminds us to be followers of God. Now, of course, we, you know, we know our history and a split in the early 1900s with a group that became, uh, continued to be known as the Disciples of Christ. Now, now they're doctrinally doing some things that aren't uh, in accordance with the Bible, so I'm not saying that, but I'm saying this is a reminder that we're followers of God. So he's a disciple and he's an apostle. Um, he chose to follow God, but he was also selected uh, by God. Did you have something on that? On that? Okay. Sure. Mm-hmm. Sure. 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 Yeah. That's right, that's right, yeah, good, good information there. Yeah, so the, we had the book of Philippians, the comment made the book of Philippians uh, to the church at Philippi, written by Paul, of course, and you see the establishment of the church there, the beginning of the church there in Acts 16 when, when Paul uh, goes uh, to Philippi, the, uh, the lady and the women by the, uh, the, the riverside and then the Philippian jailer. But uh, yes, that... that uh, that uh, area was named after uh, Philip of Macedon, the father of Alexander the Great, and um, uh, so that yeah, absolutely. And then so it's, certainly it's possible Philip being a Greek name, something we talked about last week, a Greek name that means lover of horses. It's yeah, it's it's, it's totally possible that he could have uh, uh, been named. You know, sometimes we we name people uh, after uh, figures who are, um, are well known, uh, and it's, it's certainly possible that he, he picked up that name from him. I had read something about that myself and failed to mention it last week. Um, my brother was born just a few hours after Prince William in uh, June 21st, 1982. And so mom said that when, when he was born, the nurses were saying, well, are you going to name him William? You know, he was born just a few hours after. And of course, she did not. But um, that, that, that can be a, a common thing. But yeah, it's, it's totally possible. I'd read that somewhere myself that uh, this Philip was named after the father of, uh, of Alexander the Great, uh, Philip of Macedon. And, and um, you see a lot of your cities in the New Testament, just a quick note on that, um, named after such people like, um, like the city of Philippi, like um, Thessalonica. Um, uh, uh, it's named after, it was named after a, a, a lady. Uh, that's, that's a... How do you pronounce her name? Thess, Thessalonici, I think, was, was her name. Thess, correct me if I'm wrong. Somebody correct me something, but it was named after uh, a lady. So a lot of those, a lot of those you see. And we studied some of that on Sunday night when we were having our Sunday night Bible classes. We studied some of that when we looked at churches in the New Testament. Look at John chapter 1 and verse 43. Uh, John chapter 1. As you know, we've been looking at John. It's interesting that... John is the only one who does not give us a list of the apostles in order. You know, Matthew gives us a list, Mark gives us a list, and Luke gives us a list twice. Once in the book of Luke and once in his writings in the book of Acts. But John does not give us a list. That wasn't his purpose. But we're, we're going to John 1 a lot because John is telling us about when these men first began following the Lord disciples of the Lord and um, so he spends some time on that in particularly verses um, 35 uh, through about the end of the chapter um, so next week we're going to notice another one Lord willing uh, when we get into Nathaniel but uh, Jesus himself called Philip to follow him in John chapter 1 and verse 43 the following day Jesus wanted to go to Galilee and he found Philip and he said to him follow me um, so uh, you know here was a man that the Lord, you know, said, said, follow me, and Philip was willing to do so. Remember, you have, these, you, you have these kind of faith, three phases, if you will. They begin following the Lord, but they still have their daily lives. They, I mean, they, they still, they're still going about their daily business, and that's something I think is important for us to, 
to realize and understand. And they're not the only disciples following the Lord. They're not the only people. Okay? Then the Lord, you know, Luke 5 and other places, asked for a little more commitment. And that's where they leave their fishing business and uh, forsake all to follow him. So, so they, they show a little more dedication to him. I think they still have a responsibility to their, their home lives and some of the things that's going on, but they, they're giving more. They're giving more. And then eventually the Lord uh, selects 12 of his disciples um, as apostles. You would see that in Luke's account in Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 14, where Jesus um, selected Philip as one of his apostles. Again, leading that second group of four. So you have Peter and Andrew, James and John, but then Philip leading that second group of four. But notice this, in John chapter 6, in John chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, on one occasion, Jesus directly tested Philip. Now, there are some ideas out there that maybe uh, Philip was the organizer of the group. Possibly so, possibly so. I didn't include it in your notes because I don't, I don't know. I did read it a few places where people think, you know, Judas was the, 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 the treasurer, if you will, in charge of the money bags, and um, thinks that maybe each of them had some kind of responsibility and the ideas that maybe Philip was the, the organizer, and that could be what you're seeing in John chapter 6. That might be why the Greeks came to him uh, in John chapter 12 and said, we desire to see Jesus, we wish to see Jesus. Possibly. It, it, it could be. Maybe you've heard that. Maybe you've read that. Again, I didn't include it in the notes. I, I'm not so sure if there's enough to come to that conclusion, so I didn't include it in the notes. But it certainly is a possibility. But we do see in John chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, that Jesus directly uh, will put uh, Philip to the test. So let's begin in verse 1. This is the feeding of the 5,000. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, said to Philip. So he singles out Philip here. Now, the others are there, but he's singling out Philip. Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Well, you know, even if there was a McDonald's or something around the corner, you're looking at more than 5,000 people. You know, we call, we call it the feeding of the 5,000 um, because of verse 10. Now, there was much grass in that place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Matthew's account would say besides children and women. Now, there are different ideas. Uh, some would say, you know, that number could double or more than double when you include children and women, and it could. It could. You could be looking at ten or 15,000 people. Uh, some say, well, maybe not. Uh, maybe, obviously, there was women and children because the Bible says that, but consider the location and the time of the day. Maybe it was uh, heavier on the, the, the men. And, but either way, you're still looking at more than 5,000 people. I mean, if you're looking at six or seven or 10 to 15, I don't know. Either way, that's a lot of people. And even if you had, you know, fast food restaurants on every corner trying to feed that many people at one time, obviously they don't. So Philip, uh, Jesus, I should say, says directly to Philip, where will we buy bread that these may eat? So Philip's response in verse 6, uh, or excuse me, verse 6, this Jesus said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. And it's this verse that would cause some to say, along with John 12, that maybe Philip was kind of the organizer. Maybe he's the one that Jesus kind of had planning. You know, he's, he's looking, he's seeing the crowd. He's like, this is just not possible. You know, we just we can't, logistically, we cannot do this. <laughs> Financially, we cannot do this. You know, so possibly that might let you know a little bit into his mind anyway. Um, notice a couple of points that I made from this, and we'll see what uh, you pull from the text. Life's tests are for our benefits, not to teachers. Verse 6, he said this to him, for Jesus knew what he would do. Now, sometimes we're tested in life, um, and it benefits us. 
it, it benefits us, um, these, these tests in life. One of the I am statements is I am the bread of life. Do you know how I, I know that? Because it's the only one that I could not remember on an exam. <laughs> I remembered the other six, and I could not recall. It's the only one I missed, and I was so angry. But now I remember it, and, um, and because I missed it. You know? uh, so, sometimes, sometimes we learn more about life through these tests, through, through even failing tests, uh, losing. You know, uh, We had a good team, football team, my junior year. We went out... Uh, uh, losers my senior year. We went three and eight my senior year. I learned more about life my senior year than I did my junior year. I learned more about what happens when you're not a leader, more about what happens when uh, you don't put forth the effort that you should. I learned a lot more about life that losing season than I did the winning season. So I see in John chapter 6, in verse 6, Jesus knew what he was going to do. He was testing Philip. Test Look at tests as opportunities to grow. Look at them as opportunities to, to develop. Look at them as opportunities to, you know, to, to become more. And uh, that's one thing I see. In verse 7, I see where Philip saw obstacles and Jesus saw an opportunity. As Philip says in verse 7, there are 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little. Philip sees an obstacle. And there's, we can't feed 5,000 people. We can't feed 10,000 people. However many were there, we can't do that. He sees that obstacle in front of him. And, uh, but Jesus sees an opportunity. Jesus sees an opportunity. Now, we, we, I, I think there's a great lesson there. When we're looking, whether it's individually or as a congregation as a whole, whatever, is, this, is this an obstacle that we can't overcome? Or is this an opportunity to, to do something good uh, in the Lord's church for the Lord's name? Sure. Right. Great point. That's something I had missed. You don't see Jesus rebuking P, uh, Philip here in Philip's answer. And it's not in Matthew's text because other than giving a list of the apostles, John is the one, only one who gives us any detailed information about Philip. Um, so it wouldn't be in Matthew's text. Um, but that's a good point that JP mentioned that uh, you don't see... Um, Jesus rebuking Philip here, where quite often he would, especially with his apostles, James and John, wanting to call down fire, and he rebukes them. Peter, as mentioned, quite often being rebuked by the Lord. And when you think about it, I mean, the first thing that came to my mind is Matthew 14, the same area, the, the chapter after the feeding of the 5,000, where Peter, you know, is walking on water, but then he begins sinking, um, and Jesus rebukes him for it. And I think, well... It's kind of an obstacle itself, walking on water, you know, but he begins sinking, so Jesus rebukes him. But, uh, yeah, certainly, no doubt, there's a, a lesson for us to learn here as well. And, you know, in, in, in what we do, we should do it uh, for God's glory and uh, seek his blessings. Uh, but I imagine, yeah, I, I could say I'd be the first to say this can't be done. I, if I'm standing there and I'm looking out a crowd of this, uh, of this people, um, you know, uh, that, would be, that would be challenging. Um, and, uh, but, yeah, that's a good, good point. So I think that's something that we learn is when we're looking at what needs done in the Lord's church, whether individually or, or, or again, a congregation as a whole, considering what needs done, do we say, okay, 
can't be done or this can be done, you know. And uh, that's one thing I appreciate about Alan, who was with us Wednesday night. Um, you know, I, I had opportunity to work with him about eight or nine years. And, and no matter what it, what it was, he, he, he says it can be done and it can be big. <laughs> and, and, and that's why you see a lot of the works that he's been behind uh, doing so much good for the Lord's. Uh, for, for the Lord's church. Let me tell you just a quick story. I've, I've got time. 2020, everything shuts down, right? We find out that you can't have PTP that year and everybody's at home. I made the suggestion, have a online lessons getting it ready for PTP. Have one of your speakers each week. And I was thinking simple, simple-minded. You know, guy sitting there at the kitchen table doing a lesson, keeping people encouraged, right? Within an hour, I was put in charge of this huge, huge thing that he turned it into where, you know, it was filmed by professionals in a suit and tie. They had assigned subjects. And I'm like, man, what did I get myself into? But some people think that way. So, some people think that way. Some people take that idea and then say, what's the most we can get out of this? Well, uh, again, I think that's where you see the church working together. I think that's where you see different people in the church, some recognizing obstacles, hurdles that need to be considered. They need to be considered. What is this going to take? Count the cost, right? What is that, Luke 14? Count the cost. But then some people also need to be that motivator that says, let's do it. Let's move forward. Let's push forward and let's do it. Um, notice this, number three. Philip knew the law of Moses. If you go back to John chapter 1 and verse 45, um, so in verse 43, Jesus called Philip to follow me. And uh, verse 44, now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. In verse 45 of John 1, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Philip knew the law of Moses, okay? And it is in this law that Philip would have known about God feeding the people of Israel in the wilderness. And that's a number much greater than 5,000 or 10,000 or however many were there that day. I mean, you go back and you read Exodus chapter 16, I mean, he was taking care of an entire nation of people by feeding them. And Philip would have, you know about this, Philip would have known about this. But when faced with the reality of seeing this many people, Philip loses focus on the Lord's abilities. And I think, you know, if we're not careful, that can, that can happen to us as well, that we read it and we believe it, you know, but then sometimes when we're faced with it, do we really believe it? And that's something that is important, that we keep our faith in God. We must allow the Word of God to continue to build our faith through the hurdles of life. So then faith comes by hearing in hearing by the word of God, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. So that's some points that I, I gathered from Jesus testing Philip. The one that was added that uh, you might want to jot down is Jesus did not rebuke him as he does quite often with his others. Anything else that you picked up on in uh, that section of the feeding of the 5,000?
Right. Great point, great point, absolutely. It's not a, Kevin said, it's not a pass or fail moment with, with these guys and what you're reading about. And that's not the way Jesus is. That's not the way God is. It was all to move their faith forward. And sometimes it's lessons like this, obstacles like this, that builds our faith and that moves our faith forward. That's a, a great point. Because I think all too often we as Christians look at it like pass or fail. And, you know, oh, I messed up, I'm going to hell. You know, I just, it's, we, we are to live faithful, this is true. First John, the blood of Christ will continue to cleanse us if we keep letting our faith move forward through the word of God, repent when we fail, and, and, and pick up and keep on. And uh, yeah, great, great point there on um, uh, this is just faith building for them. And no doubt you could probably all give stories of times that your faith was really uh, building in the Lord. And reference back to John 2 and the Cana of uh, Galilee with the, the, the wedding feast turning water into wine. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, says, whatever he says, do it. And, uh, not that she would have known everything that was going to happen, but she had faith that he would take care of it. And I, as you were making that comment, I thought, you know, uh, that perhaps could be after 30 years of faith building. You know, there's so much in the first 30 years of our Lord's life that we don't know. We know a little bit about his birth. We know a little bit at the age of 12. But then that's it until he's 30. So you have all those years that we don't know about of faith building for Mary. And with these disciples, you have about three years. And uh, so, yeah, great, great comment there. Sure, sure. So, yeah, uh, Philip noticing the um, a comment made by David. Philip noticing the uh, um, the people, noticing the people, stating the facts. Uh, I lost it for a sec. Stating the facts of, of who was before them, and uh, when Jesus asked, um, "Where uh, where will they eat? Where will we get the food?" and he's stating the facts of what is what is uh, before them, and um, all these people, and and what what it would take, what it would uh, you know. The, what's before them. Um, and certainly we, we see that if you go back to Matthew's account in the feeding of the 5,000, then once again in the feeding of the 4,000, remember you have two different feedings. Uh, no doubt through this event, though, their faith is building, uh, you know, through, through these events, like, like the other events that the Lord was, 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 um, was, present, was, was performing before them. And um, so it's, it's, just, it's just interesting to, to think think about all of that in this, this man's life. Let's notice this, uh, let's, so we don't uh, uh, run out of time here. Letter D, um, on the somber night of our Lord's betrayal, there's proof that the apostles still had a long way to go in developing their faith. Philip's response to Jesus helps confirm this proof. Look to John chapter 14. So if you remember, if you take chapters out of it, from John 13 to the end of the book, you're just a few, a, a, few, a few hours. From John 13 to John 20, all happens within a 24-hour period. Okay, so that's the Passover, the washing their feet, the prayer, the betrayal, the crucifixion, the resur not the resurrection, but the crucifixion, and then chapter 21, you get into the resurrection. Chapter 20, you get into the resurrection and the end of the book. Um, anyways, my point is this. In John 14, you're on that night, okay? And the Lord is having some of these final discussions with his apostles, minus Judas. All right? Judas leaves at the, in chapter 13. So Judas has gone off to do his thing and betray the Lord. So as our Lord with the 11 apostles... And he knows. I mean, he's just hours away 
from this betrayal. So in John 14, very familiar passage of Scripture. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said in verse 5, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? That's when Jesus said in verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, we're familiar with these six verses. We read them often. Uh, you hear them often at funerals, uh, sometimes being read. But when you pick up in verse 7, Jesus said, if you had known me, speaking to his apostles on the night of his betrayal, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. And notice Philip's response in verse 8 when he said to him, Lord, show us the father and it is sufficient for us. Now you think about what's going on that night. Think about the, the, the mindset of our Lord knowing what he's about to go through and, and, and the betrayal and the beatings and the cross, the suffering. And Philip said, after this time with them, show us the Father. And notice our Lord's response in verse 9. Have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? There he gets singled out <laughs> in a way that he probably doesn't want to be singled out. Read it, have I been with you so long and you've not yet known me, Philip? If I'm with those men, if, and, 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 and he's, he, if it's a group, it's one thing, right? <laughs> but if he singles me out by name, I'm wanting to kind of hide behind the other ones. You know, I'm like, oh no, what's going on? What did I do? <laughs> have I been with you so long and you have yet not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father, so how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the words. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Um, here, here's Philip and, and John, uh, Thomas' response. You know, there's, we're, we're, it kind of goes back. It's not pass or fail, but it's faith building. and he, We're seeing where... I mean, they still, they, they, they're not where they need to be. They're, they're still developing. And again, I, 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 myself, I, I appreciate the, that being in the Bible because I, I'm reminded in, in my own life of uh, needing to continue on and continue to learn. A comment that I made, um, it is possible to know the Scriptures, know God exists, know what to do to be saved from your sins, know what is expected in Christian worship, Yet not know the Father or the Savior. And there's that relationship. People will sometimes say, I just wish the Bible was just one page. It tells me everything to do and then I'm done with it. I'm not done with it in the sense of being done, but just knowing, here it is. You know, bullet points. It can't be like that. It can't be like that. The, the Bible, it, it does tell us what to do and not to do, but it's not just a rule book. It's a relationship book. It teaches us how to have a relationship with God. And, and, and that's why we go back and study it. Not just to know what the words say, but to make the words become your life. To, to where God, it, it, Colossians 3, He is our life. You know, we're focused on things above. So it's possible to know all this stuff, but yet not really know God. And, and I would encourage all of us to seek God, learn, find Him, know Him, whatever it takes, know Him. It might take a little extra effort early in the morning or late at night or going somewhere by yourself, but through prayer and study, fasting, meditation, know God more than just a book, more than just a set of rules. Know who God is. The Pharisees knew the law, although they twisted it often to teach their own doctrines. But they did not know who gave the law. And I think we need to make sure that we, we know God uh, and, and who He is and that personal relationship 
uh, with him. From time to time, I have opportunity to speak to preachers, and one of the first things I'll tell them, especially if it's a younger group of preachers, you make sure you keep your personal relationship with God as a top priority. Because if you're missing on, out on that, you need to step away from the pulpit for how long, however long it takes to get that right. If you can't minister to others and preach to others and teach others in the, in a, the right way in an effective way if you yourself aren't in a close relationship with God. So thoughts or comments on that? We have, might hang over, let the last part kind of hang over a little bit till next week, but that is fine. Yes, sir. Yeah, reading a book other than the Bible and just love the book, love reading it, uh, uh, but not knowing the author, not knowing uh, who he is and, uh, uh, and spend your life not knowing him. Yeah, God is uh, the author of this book, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. Uh, all of it comes by his inspiration. It is his words. God breathed. It is his words uh, to us. Any other thoughts on that? Great point, great point. We, be, we, uh, we try to limit God. We limit God sometimes. And uh, that's kind of what you see in Philip doing in Ephesians 3. He can do so much above our, what we imagine. That's a great point, great point to end on. Don't limit God. Don't limit God. Let him take you to the next level. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your kind attention. We'll wrap Philip up possibly next, uh, next Sunday and uh, then move on. Thank you.